Father, thank you for gathering us here together this morning. Our glorious Father, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation that we may know you better. Amen. Well, what is the church? Uh, if you went down to Balmoral and asked some people down walking along the beach there this morning what the church is, I suspect you'll get some answers a bit like this. Uh, some people might say that the church is an institution. Uh, some might say that it's a bit of an outdated institution as part of that. Uh, some might say that the church is a building. Uh, if you put the question slightly differently and said to someone, where's the nearest church down at Balmoral Beach? Hopefully they'd be able to say to you, well, go up the hill, up Raglan Street, cross over at Military Road at the lights, keep on going about 600 meters on the right, and you'd find yourselves here. Some people think the church is a building. Uh, others might say that the church is a group of people. A local group of people who gather together usually on a Sunday, just like we're doing here in some kind of building. Maybe a traditional kind of church building like this. Maybe it's a school. Maybe it's a cinema. Now, churches gather in all sorts of buildings. Now, or maybe some people would say that the church is God's people worldwide, thinking about more than just the local church. And it's the gathering of God's people or what's called the universal church. Now, if we came across the Apostle Paul down at Balmoral Beach, uh, he would say three things from Ephesians chapters 2 and 3 about the church. And they're there in your outline for you. He would say that the church is Jew and Gentile made into one new humanity, reconciled to God, and a building, a holy temple, a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, Paul says the church is these three mind-blowing truths that we're going to look at this morning. Now, so let's take a look at this first truth. The church is Jew and Gentile made into one new humanity. Now, as Paul begins this section of his letter from chapter 2, verse 11, he describes the plight of Gentiles, so those who aren't Jews by birth. And it's a bleak picture that he paints. Have a look with me at verses two, uh, 11 to 12. Paul says, Therefore remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, for they weren't, by those who call themselves the circumcision, that is the Jews, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time... Before they came to know Jesus, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. It's a bleak picture, isn't it? No hope, no God, they're far away, and they're excluded, excluded from God and excluded from God's people. And of course, the temple still standing in Jerusalem at the time Paul was writing somewhere in the late 60s AD physically models this separation. Uh, here's a, a picture of maybe what the temple was like, Herod's temple there in Jerusalem. And uh, in that kind of uh, lower a third of the temple where that arrow is pointing to, uh, to the left of that dividing wall there, is the court of the Gentiles. And that dividing wall there is called the Soreg. It's a low latticed screen or railing that prohibited Jews or non, I'm sorry, prohibited Gentiles or non purified Jews from entering further into the temple courts. Now, the Jewish historian Josephus describes it like this He says, It's a stone wall for a partition with an inscription which forbade a foreigner to go in under pain of death. And uh, more recently, in the end, the 19th century, they found some of these inscription signs, some of these warning signs, uh, obviously in stone, and here one is in Greek, and the translation goes roughly like this. No stranger is to enter within the balustrade round the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. 
that Paul, the Apostle Paul, who was a Jew himself, fell foul of this. In Acts chapter 21, verse 28 and following, we hear that some Jews drag Paul out from the temple because he's come to Jerusalem uh, after one of his missionary journeys with some Gentiles, some Greeks, and they assume that Paul has brought these Greeks into the temple, but he hasn't. But they run with their assumption, they're against Paul, and they drag him out of the temple and they seek to kill him. And the Roman commander has to actually send troops in down to swoop and rescue Paul from this murderous crowd of Jews. This separation is real. And the Gentiles are despised by God's people, the Jews. And it goes the other way as well. Now, Paul goes on to describe in this passage a great hostility between those descended from Abraham, the Jews, and all others, Gentiles. And sadly, we still see this hostility today, don't we? Now, William Barclay, a Christian writer, describes this hostility between Gentile and Jew at the time Paul writes like this. He says, the Jews had an immense contempt for the Gentile. The Gentiles, said the Jews, were created by God to be fuel for the fires of hell. They said that God loves only Israel out of all the nations that he has made. It was not even lawful to render help to a Gentile mother in her hour of sorest need when she's giving birth to children. For that would be simply to bring another Gentile into the world. It's pretty stark, isn't it? Until Christ came, the Gentiles were an object of contempt to the Jews. The barrier between them was absolute. If a Jewish boy married a Gentile girl or a Jewish girl married a Gentile boy, the funeral of that Jewish boy or girl was carried out. Such contact with a Gentile was the equivalent of death. That is the hostility between Jew and Gentile. The Gentiles were separated from the Jews and they were separated from God, a double separation. But God has overcome this bleak picture. Just as we had a great but in the start of Ephesians 2 last week, where God works and brings dead people to life, we now have a great but in verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, you Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, and he's made the two groups into one. He's destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself One new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. In Jesus, these two fighting, warring factions, which everyone falls into in humanity, these two groups of people can be made one. And the church is a new creation, Paul writes. Jesus' purpose was to create in himself one new humanity, Out of the two, no longer Jew, Gentile, but the church. Now the church in Ephesus was a diverse church. There were Jews who'd been made alive in Christ. And there were Gentiles who'd been made alive in Christ. There were rich Christians. No doubt there would have been poor Christians. There were male Christians. There were female Christians. There were slaves who were Christians. There were masters who were Christians. There were children who were Christians. There were parents who were Christians. We'll see some more on these groupings and Paul's teaching to them as we go on in his letter. The church in Ephesus was diverse. And the whole church, as the gospel spread in the time of Paul and his missionary journeys, and ever since then, is diverse, isn't it? We just need to read Acts to see the diversity of the church and how there are issues between Jewish and Gentile Christians. But in Christ Jesus, Paul says, you are united. This diverse church is united in him. Jesus has made the two groups one. Jesus has made one new humanity out of the two. Jesus has made them one body, he speaks of. Doesn't sound so revolutionary to us, does it? But to Jews and Gentiles at that time, this would have been shocking and shockingly awesome. And our church and the church worldwide now is diverse, isn't it? 
but yet united. The church is made up of many different people, including Jews and Gentiles, whom God has brought into his family. And the church is a dynamic group of people, many of whom will not be like me and many of whom will not be like you. And that's a good thing. And while the church is defined by the gospel, we're either dead outside of it or alive inside in by Christ and his grace, When we're inside, those whom God has brought from death to life, we shouldn't divide any more after that. There shouldn't be any internal division in the church. We must not let class divide the church, or race divide the church, or nationality divide the church, or education divide the church, or politics divide the church, or I could go on, couldn't I? It's terribly sad when we hear of churches divided, of polarization amongst them, perhaps particularly from polarization in the world outside. You only need to think of American politics to see how that is dividing churches. But we're not immune from that here either in Australia. Politics and viewpoints on different issues have and will divide churches. But just as Jesus broke down the great division of Jew and Gentile, and made the two one, Jesus breaks down all kinds of divisions that there might be and unites us into one family. God has made these two groups one horizontally. He's brought peace on this human plane through the Lord Jesus. And he's also brought peace vertically in a heavenly plane. Paul goes on to say that the church is Jew and Gentile made into one new humanity. And then that one new humanity, that one body is reconciled vertically to God. The church is reconciled to God. To be reconciled is to be brought back into relationship with someone, isn't it? A friendship is restored. A family relationship is restored through reconciliation. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for us with his Father, vertically. Ephesians chapter 2, 16. Paul says that in this one body that now exists of Jew and Gentiles, he has worked to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. And that hostility is hostility towards God. Last week, we saw that this hostility exists between humanity and God because we're rebels against him. We don't follow God and his ways and his son, the Lord Jesus. Instead, we follow the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so by nature, we are deserving of God's wrath, his right anger at our rebellion against him. But Jesus, through his death on the cross in our place, has put to death our hostility on that vertical plane with God. And so we have peace. Paul puts it wonderfully like this. He, Jesus, came, he entered this world and preached peace to you who are far away, Gentiles, And he preached peace to those who were near, Jews. Both Jew and Gentiles needed and need the peace that Jesus brings. For through him, Jesus, we both have access to the Father. There's restoration of that relationship. There's access now to the Father by the one Spirit. In his life, death, and resurrection, Jesus preaches peace. He preaches peace to all. And so now both Jews and Gentiles through Jesus and by the one Spirit of God have access to the Father. The church is Jews and Gentiles made into one new humanity, reconciled to God. But until Jesus returns, Paul goes on to liken the church to a building site. A building site where the church is a building or a holy temple or a dwelling in, what, in which God lives by his spirit. Here's how he puts it in chapter 2, verse 19. Consequently, because of this reconciliation to God, you Gentiles are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with God's people, also members of his household. You're part of the family now. 
built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. God is in the building project. He's building a house. And what holds this together is the cornerstone Jesus. And the foundation are the teachings of Jesus. Written about and explained for us in the New Testament. Here is God building his house. Paul goes on to say, verse 21, In him, in Jesus, the whole building is joined together and it rises to become not just a house now, but a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. This is a wonderful picture, isn't it, of God building his church, his new covenant temple, the place where God now lives by his spirit. So let me ask you, as Paul describes what the church is, are you thinking rightly about the church? Now maybe you just think church is something to attend for an hour on a Sunday, but it's not. Church is who we are as God's people that he's brought together into one family and reconciled to God and now dwells in by his spirit. Now, church isn't just a, a service that's provided. It's a community to be a part of. So let me say to you, stay after the service as part of this community. Don't rush off, but engage here with your church family. Now, that might mean there's implications for other things that you do on a Sunday. But let me challenge you. I think Paul challenges you with what the church is, to be with one another, to spend time with one another. You might be an introvert, and that's okay. Find another introvert and have a bit of a chat with them. Or find out from someone else and listen. Maybe you're a good listener. Another great way of being part of the church during the week is to join a growth group. Now, one of our little midweek groups where you can gather with others from the church and encourage one another in following the Lord Jesus and build one another up in that holy temple where God dwells by his spirit. Another way to be part of the church more is to serve in the church. Use the gifts that God has given you. Now, use them on a Sunday, yes, but maybe there's other ways in the week as well. Uh, on, on the... Um, Back table, we've got uh, little cards. I can't find one I brought up now. Uh, here it is, little cards, uh, welcome cards. Uh, on the back side of that is the top one is a QR code uh, for if you're new here. If we don't have your contact details, uh, we'd love to have your contact details so we can keep in touch with you. That's the top code. But the second one is a next step QR code. It says, faith is a journey, take your next step. And you can let us know that you'd like to join a growth group or you'd like to think about how you can serve. We might like to give financially to the church through that. Uh, if you want to be more involved, then take one of those QR codes and, and, the, and scan the bottom code there. Uh, get involved at other times at church, at our prayer meetings on a Monday night. Once a month for an hour we gather for a very significant and important time to pray to God. Up in the loft every first Monday of the month, 7.30. Come and join us there. Come to the social events we do. Uh, there are ways in which God is building his church. Come to the conferences that we go to together. It was great to have a group of 20 guys going to base camp uh, at the University of New South Wales a couple of weekends ago. Church isn't a service that's provided, but it's a community to be part of. It's God's family. Because the church is Jew and Gentile made into one new humanity, reconciled to God and being built into a temple where God lives by his spirit. But how has God done this? I've got three more points. They're going to be very brief. How has God done this? Well, the simple answer is in Jesus. In him. I don't know if you've heard that phrase come up time and time again in Ephesians. The spotlight is always on Jesus. This is how God is working. This is how he's building his church. It's in Jesus Christ, in him or in himself or through him, Jesus. Comes up seven times, I think it is, in just these first 11 verses from chapter 2, verse 11. Verse 13, the blood of Christ has brought us near. Gentiles who were once far away. Verse 14, he, Jesus himself, is our peace. Not he gives us peace, but he is the peace. 
who has made these two warring factions one. Verse 16, in himself, Jesus has reconciled not only Jew and Gentile to them, to one another, but also to God through the cross. Verse 21, in him, God's building the temple is joined together and is being built together. Jesus is the master builder in God's building project. And it's only in Christ Jesus that God is building his church. Now, sadly, across the world, many churches are dying because they've moved away from Jesus. But where Jesus is known and made known, God will be building his church. This wonderful new humanity of Jew and Gentile together reconciled to God. And this building project of the church has always been God's plan. In chapter 3, Paul talks about the church of Jew and Gentile reconciled to God as a mystery. In ages past, this idea of bringing Gentiles and Jews together and to God was hidden. It wasn't well known. There were glimmers of it in the Bible. God's people, the Jews, were supposed to be a blessing to the nations. They were supposed to be a light to them that they might come in. But it didn't really happen. But Paul says now, in Christ Jesus, this is happening. Verse 6 of chapter 3. This mystery is that through the gospel, through Jesus coming into the, into the world, dying for our sins, rising to give us new life, through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And God, Paul goes on to explain, has tasked him, Paul, with explaining this mystery and making this mystery plain to everyone now. See, the church has always been God's plan. Now, the church isn't God's plan C. It's his plan A. Let me explain. It's not like God tried to build his church with Adam and Eve and their family and then it all went wrong. It's not like God tried again, plan B, okay, well, I'll work through Abraham and his family line. And that went well for a time, didn't it? And God's people grew and became a great nation and followed him. But then it ended in failure, didn't it? And it all burnt to the ground, literally. And so it's not like God thinks, okay, well, third time lucky. Maybe I'll strike lucky third time. I'll try making a new people from Jew and Gentile through Jesus. It's not his plan C, third time lucky. It's his plan A. It always has been God's plan to bring people together to him through the Lord Jesus, the church. And finally, Paul says something quite mind-blowing. The church declares God's wisdom in the heavenly realms. This heavenly realms idea keeps on coming up, doesn't it, in Ephesians? It's an important thing to Paul and to them. And Paul says the church shows how wise God is in the heavenly realms. Chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. His intent, God's intent, was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God or the many-colored wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities, not on earth, and across the world, no, but in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. There's that idea that this is always God's plan again. See, the church, if you like, is a bit like a, a prism where white light is split up into many colors, and the church shows the many colored wisdom of God to the heavenly realms. It shows how great God is. It says, isn't he amazing? Bringing Jew and Gentile together into one humanity and then bringing them back to God himself so that they have access to God and then dwelling in them by his spirit. The church shows the many-colored wisdom of God. It gives him glory as it shines God's multicolored wisdom into the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms even. See, just as a wonderful painting that declares how great the painter is or a wonderful piece of music that is played displays the brilliance of the composer and the performers or a wonderful world record in the Olympics shows how great an Olympian is. So the church declares how great God is and how wise he is 
in the heavenly realms. God's angels in the heavenly realms are rejoicing at what's going on in the church. Demons and other evil powers are shuddering at what God is doing in the church and his wisdom displayed there as they realize their end is near. Because everything is coming together under Christ. Just as Jew and Gentile have now come together under Christ and to God, everything is heading that way. Paul said this in Ephesians 1 verse 10, that God is bringing unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. And the church, if you like, is a foretaste of that. Ready for heaven and earth to be united together under Christ. Where the world, the flesh and the devil will be no more. So I wonder if you realize the significance of the church. Whether we think about our local church or the wider whole church, as the creed puts it, the the Catholic church, that is the general universal church. It's easy, isn't it, to think that the church is insignificant. It's easy to look and see that maybe it's shrinking in different places, certainly in many Western countries, but not in others. In Africa and parts of Asia, it's growing massively. God is building his church. His masterpiece, his multicolored masterpiece. And in the church, he's showing his victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. As he brings Jew and Gentile together into one new humanity and reconciles them to God and then dwells in this building project by his Holy Spirit. God is building his church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for what you're doing here and all throughout the world as Jesus is proclaimed and made known. We thank you that you are building your church. Lord, we praise you that you have broken down hostility, the age-old hostility between Jew and Gentile, but now Jesus breaks down all hostility Father, we pray that we would look to him so there would not be any divisions or factions in our church. Thank you that Jesus has reconciled us to you and now that you live in us by your Holy Spirit and you're working in us, building us into that holy temple. And this is declaring your glory, your wisdom in the heavenly realms. Earthly realms may not see that so much. They may scoff at the church. Or worse, persecute the church. But Lord, as you build the church, it is declaring your glory in the heavenly realms. We thank you for what you're doing and how we are a part of it. We praise your name. Amen.